This broadcast of OPF Radio on January 21st of 2013 is about security teams. Gary Hunt is the guest, and your host is Sleepy Salsa. <laughs> And that was a dangerous situation by Ashley Alisai. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this particular episode of OPF Radio. If you think about it, self-preservation and defense, whether collective or individually, is about as fundamental an instinct that man can have. Absent such instinct, what else is left? Your life does not belong to you, nor does your property. Absent those, even your thoughts are without meaning. All rights, liberties, and any other notions of freedom are only be maintained by the willingness of individuals to use physical force against criminals and tyrants alike. It is upon this foundation of the individual right of self-defense that the collective form emanates. Gary Hunt, who is an active patriot for 30 years, will be discussing with us tonight about a security team that he was a member of, as well as laying out the fundamentals of the concept that is a security team. With that said, let us go to our guest. Gary, are you with us? Yes, I am. All and, right. Uh, how are you this evening, Sleepy? I'm doing quite well, quite well, sir. Well, let's go Cold ahead and jump into it. here, huh? <laughs> I guess you could say that. Well, let's go ahead and jump into it. Gary, what is a security team? Well, a security team, let's see. Second Amendment guarantees the right to militia, and uh, the foundation of that goes back really to the Magna Carta and the right of self-defense. That uh, Our right of individual self-defense or self-defense of our family has to be inherent because without life, no rights have any meaning at all. Militia is a collective in the community level, and it's administered by the civil authority that exists in that community. Uh, Security teams is something that we do, created. Uh, we we created a security team back in 1992, uh, somewhere in between the two. It wasn't me. It wasn't the other members. But we all came together to provide a security team for our self defense should the need arose. Now the reason we did that is I had begun I had prepared to uh, to publish the Outpost of Freedom newspaper and George Sibley and Linda Lyon were already publishing Liberatus magazine and some friends of ours felt that you know we might be creating a risk for ourselves because we were writing basically anti-government stuff and this is relatively early on most of the Patriot community back then was IRS involvement but we were going beyond that they had done some articles on the 14th amendment I had done some on you know, the government uh, control of taking children from people and Operation Monarch. So the concern about us was uh, that we might get hassled by the government. So six of us, uh, the six men in the team, uh, met one Thursday at my office. We agreed to meet there, and then we went to a restaurant and uh, sat down and started developing this plan around the security team. It was rather loose at the time. And now George had asked if his wife Linda could join the team as well because she was the co-editor of Liberatus Magazine, so we agreed. And then she came in the next meeting. And uh, so the security team was basically formed. And it w its purpose, as I say, is somewhere between individual self-defense and militia. We're not subject to civil authority. Uh, we're a civil body in ourselves looking to protect only ourselves. It's not an aggressive function. It's strictly a defensive function. function. Okay, so what kind of operations does a security team perform? Uh, initially, you know, our, our idea, well, there were a couple concepts involved initially. One is the self-protection, and the other one is possible exp subsequent expansion of the security team to involve more people, but they would never be on the same tier uh, that we were, but uh, we'll leave that for a little later. Uh, the applications, except for defense, had not been addressed, and the first situation came up about mid-February, 
and I had published the first edition out of out the Post of Freedom newspaper, and I'd been speaking with some people in California that were uh, working with Ted Gunderson, uh, Mark Phillips, and people like that about ch ritual child abuse, and um, one evening, uh, some people were at the office, a couple of them were members of the security team, even though it wasn't a security team meeting, and uh, there was a knock on the door, and so I answered the door, and he said, I'm Peter Chernoff, and I hadn't heard the name before, but uh, I said, come on in, and he said, no, you've got other people in there, can you, uh, uh, I need to talk to you long, so I asked everybody to leave, and then Peter came in, and, he, and then Linda and, and Alex and the person that drove that uh, 3,000 miles from California came in, and Peter explained that he had fled California with his son Alex because Alex's mother wanted to put him in Miss Sandy's daycare, which is associated with Michael Aquino. He was on the board of directors of the Miss Sandy's daycare, and Alex was concerned, or Peter was concerned about Alex being getting involved in ritual child abuse. Um, my secretary had told me that she'd seen a white car going back and forth during the day, so I was kind of concerned about keeping him there. And so I called one of the security team members who uh, lived alone and uh, explained without saying too much that I needed to bring some people down there uh, that needed a place to stay for the night. So we went down there and I explained to him uh, basically what was happening and these people were being looked for by the FBI and so he had no qualms he took them into his house they stayed there for five or six weeks seven weeks I guess um, and they were very comfortable we had some rules Peter could not use the phone for anything um, they were if they went for a walk they were supposed to go with somebody you know we had set some rules up now, see, all this stuff developed as we did it, so we wrote the rules as we uh, went, but of the security team, only uh, the person who they were staying with, myself, George, and Linda knew about this, and George and Linda acted as security because I had my business and had, I had to be at the office uh, eight hours, oh, eight, at least eight hours a day. And then uh, on oh, March 5th, I went to Waco, and they were still staying with the security team. Um, so the first application was hiding a patriot from the FBI, which we did quite well. Uh, the FBI actually came to my office looking for Peter Chernoff once, and I don't want to say I lied to the FBI. Let me tell them I say I didn't tell them the whole truth, and and so they they walked away from that investigation. Uh, at Waco, I was taking on the government, uh, going on radio programs. I think I did over a hundred during the, the time I was in Waco. I was putting out the fact uh, fax releases and really putting the FBI on the spot with some of the things that I was writing, which were truthful, they weren't CNN stuff. So there was concern in the security team over my security when I came back, so we made arrangements. Uh, we reserved a flight to Denver, Colorado, and in, uh, in talking with people, I said, I'm going to cancel the, my return to Florida and going to Denver. The FBI had moved in the room next to me, and we figured they'd tap the phones at the motel. And uh, any communication about what was really happening was done payphone to payphone, Orlando to, uh, uh, to to Waco, Texas. And so the arrangements were made, and the flight to Colorado would have been two hours after the Orlando flight. So it was the morning that I went up to uh, Dallas Fort Worth to get on the flight, uh, we were talking quite loudly in my room. Well, let's get an early start. I want to have breakfast and relaxed before the flight and I got there just in time for the Orlando flight. When I got to Orlando, uh, security at Orlando at the concourse, beginning of the concourse, they had metal detectors. Uh, so nobody could, like it is today, this is back in 93. But, uh, so nothing could be done in the security area, but if I got through the security area or even if I came out with somebody in the security from the security area, that they could have acted. And so when I walked out of the security area, I just kind of glanced around this lobby, this long circular area, and over the, up and across and over to the right, I saw three members of the security team, and I knew they were armed. And so as we left, one of them got joined me, and the other two followed for a while to make sure we weren't being followed. And uh, so that was the second application, and it came together beautifully, and it came through with a minimum and and uh, 
conversation that was outside of the normal. Uh, the next instance uh, occurred when oh, oh, now when I got back, George and Linda didn't want me to go back to my off my house or my office because they were still concerned that something might happen. So they rented a motel room. Uh, I stayed in the motel room that night, and George and Linda stayed with me. And uh, they were on guard all night. One of them was awake all night long while I slept. Uh, my son came to visit me. I contacted him and got him to come down. And I actually had somebody contact him and had come, him come down to see me. And uh, when he opened, when he knocked on the door and the door opened, he was facing two people holding nine millimeters pointed at him. And it kind of shook him up, but he understood why. And we also did a little bit with the radio program uh, where the program was actually uh, pre-recorded on the telephone, but it was treated as if, if it was live, even to the point of, it was a guy up in Sanford, not too far from Castlebury, where I was. The uh, it, He ran the, the tape on the, his radio show and said, well, Gary's not here yet, doing everything to make it sound like it was a live show. Uh, we were wait, wait, waiting to see if the doors busted down at the radio station because the implication was I had walked in there and I was there and it didn't happen. So that was something George and Linda created, just a little test to see if anything was going to happen. So after that, we felt comfortable. The next application of the security team came when I was up on the Indian Reservation and George and Linda were arrested for killing a lo uh, Officer Motley of the Opelika Police Department. Um, they had been using my fax machine while I was gone to fax out to people around the country and you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know that there, this much concern was that necessary, but this is how well we function. When I finally got in touch with George and Linda when they were in jail, uh, Linda said, you need to get your copy machine, she gave me the instructions, destroy it, take it out in the woods, destroy it and find the chips and take them somewhere else and destroy them. So I called a member of the security team, told them how to get a key to my office, and I said this needs to be done right away. Um, go to the office, get the fax machine, uh, take it out in the swamp somewhere, take an ax, tear it into little pieces, look for all the electronic chips in it, take them somewhere else and throw them in the river or creek. Uh, he called me back about three hours later and said, job's done. And so, uh, just to keep the, the list of, now, I'm not sure, but this was Linda's supposition, both what was faxed out and the number it went to could be stored on that chip. And knowing what storing capabilities are today was quite true. And her concern was that. I don't know what was what she faxed on the machine, but the fact is the team responded beautifully in addressing uh, a concern that that had to be dealt with. Uh, so those are applications that came into being of necessity for the security team. None of them were aggressive, none were going after anybody else. All of them were completely defensive towards our team or protecting somebody from outside that gave his faith, handed his, his, the trust over to us to protect him from the FBI. So the applications of the security team really can't be anticipated but if you have a good team it can respond to any situation we also uh when i got back to uh, at return at my return from waco we set up what we call dead man calling i had to call one of the team members uh by five o'clock every afternoon and if i didn't then they would begin looking for me uh they would start calling around they would team member would go to the office or anything. Now occasionally if I was going to be somewhere at five, I might call them early and say I'm not going to be here. Now I can, we continue to use, not the team, but I have used that same function with uh, the dead man calling with other people uh, because, hey, if I get arrested, who's going to know it? Now the only way you can know it is if I don't make the call and then somebody starts looking into it. Otherwise, oh, well, I haven't heard from Gary for a week or two. I, I wonder if something happened. So the dead man calling system, called by a certain time, uh, is a functional way. It's like the lawnmower switch. You take your finger off, the lawnmower stop, uh, stops. 
it's a functional way of providing security without having to to, to see somebody to make sure uh, and we used it in one case on a nine o'clock in the morning five o'clock in the afternoon uh, time interval uh, so these are applications of the security team these are things that can be done uh, by them and, and hey use your imagination or wait and see what happens and uh, if you have a good team they will adapt to the circumstances now I, I guess the penultimate question I guess that would be on the minds of militiamen would be what are the differences between a security team and a militia unit well I don't think any of the members of our security team was in the militia but uh, there's no reason you couldn't be in a security team and the militia. Now, if the militia were properly formed, it would be subordinate to mil military, uh, civil authority. Uh, but if you were called up to the militia, you would have to give that precedence over the security team. But the difference is the militia is the defense of the community. It's done by the civil authority. It is a collective, but it includes people that aren't necessarily members. Uh, it has less security as far as intelligence security. I mean, we were a very secretive group. Um, so, so militia has a function in life. But uh, if people have particular concerns, uh, are they going to rely on the militia? How about the local police? You know, was that old saying? The police are only minutes away when seconds count. Uh, the militia is the same way, but the security team is, let's say, a step beyond minute men. They are immediate. They're there in there is thirty second men, half half minute men. Uh, but their purpose is very limited. It is only for that concept of self preservation. It is not an aggressive team. Though we contemplated in some of our discussions that it, under some circumstances possibly used as an aggressive or offensive team, uh, we never really went anywhere with that uh, had no desire to unless it was absolutely necessary and functional to defense uh, but a militia now you're part of a team this in military order UCMJ uh, in theory applies the the chain of command uh, the militia has these rigid set of rules and you're in a command structure you're not as flexible I mean look at the military they've got they started with uh, uh, in World War II with special teams, the uh, British had the uh, SAS and uh, we had the OSS and then we went to special forces, we've got Rangers, we've got these CIA guys running out. They're acting more like a security team. They, they work everything out among themselves. They're detached from the militia. Well, that's in a sense what the security team is. is to la uh, they're detached from the military, the security team is not even attached in any way shape or form to the militia it's a but it operates uh, with the uh, close-knit communication and the camaraderie that you would see on a lot of these military teams teal seal team six uh, except not in the offensive manner we don't go as I don't believe in assassinating people let me put it that way no I can't really say that um, <laughs> Uh, so the difference is very distinct, uh, that one's apples, one's oranges, basically. All right, well, I, it's in, I, I'm aware of those in the uh, Patriot community who like to focus more on uh, survival-type things. So, and, and I know a common concept is, is, you know, if you get a bunch of guys together and you go into, uh, you know, your bug-out location, you defend that location. I know that's been kind of a concept that's been going around uh, the, the circles uh, for the past several years at least. So I guess the really key question for people who are more that kind of mindset is a survivalist retreat group a type of security team? Well, uh, I would say so. Now when you hear bug out though, most people have their own bug out plans, their own bug out bags, and they're not uh, a cooperative group. But if you had a, and I don't like the term survivalist because if something does happen in this country, I'm not trying to survive. I'm trying to return it back to what it should be. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the ethical background of, of survivalist uh, retreat group and a security team might be different, or and the moral background perhaps as well. But yes, a survivalist group would definitely be a security team uh, if it was a group. Now, there's a group that I'm aware of, and I don't want to say where, 
where they have some land and they're they're shoring it up but the problem and here's where a difference comes in if I was the security team survivalist retreat group only the members of the group and their families would know in fact the children would not know only the people in the family was that needed to know would know anything about anything a survivalist group tends to advertise uh, what they've done is uh, expose themselves quite frankly to infiltration to uh, and, and here we get back to you want to enlist people after get more and more people in survivalist retreat group obviously would be looking at the more people we have the better off we are as long as they all bring their fair share into uh, in terms of food and, and other necessities of the team so in a way it's similar it's a contact between people but one has a uniqueness and, uh, and lack of exposure where the other one has commonality and complete exposure right well I guess the corollary uh, to that would be are there security teams that would not be a retreat group then uh, a security team isn't designed it, we didn't have a bug out location we had an assembly point uh, if something happened and we felt the need then everybody was we had taken a quad sheet you know a geographic map and marked three locations I'm a surveyor and I knew that we could get to all three of these fairly easily they could be entered from different directions they're almost unsusceptible to infrared because of the density of the vegetation so we identified three locations A B and C uh, for assembly points they were called assembly points they were not intended to be survival points we were not looking at survival in that context at that time, I don't know if I would now. We had talked about other things. Where is food supplied in a yeah, food distribution warehouse? Where are guns uh, stored uh, in a gun, sh gun shop? Uh, we looked at the means of acquiring means of survival, but we weren't looking at a camp out situation for survival. Uh, we would have hid in plain sight after we got our act together and worked, uh, worked together in that capacity so in that sense we're different from the retreat group and the uh, bug that was not even a part of the design uh, all right security well, team, I, mean, I could if they they chose to if they were a security team and had security and instead of that our assembly area decided that and it, it possibly could be used for that that they could go and live there uh, almost without detection because of the density of the foliage, the availability of water, all you have to need is the food and the toilet paper and the necessities of life, they could create a survival group. So I don't want to say no in that one direction, but a survival group per se is not a security team unless it, it, it structures a security. So uh, to answer your question, a security team could be a, a, a retreat group under certain circumstances, but the key element is it, it's not open, it's closed. Nobody knows about it except those that are members. All right, well, uh, yeah, I, I've, you know, been doing some book reports and all that and, and reviews of books on guerrilla warfare, and it's interesting, a common theme I keep seeing over and over again is the notion of the guerrilla band. And I've noticed other people, you know, t different types of political dissidents and people within the Patriot community as well mentioning about guerrilla warfare. So... I guess my next question would be, are guerrilla bands the same as a security team, or are they different? I'd say they're completely different. A guerrilla band wants to have a command structure. Uh, let's, let's look at the Marquis in, in France during World War uh, One or World War II, because it's probably the most well-known of guerrilla bands. There were guerrilla bands in the American Civil War, uh, but in, in every, every case there's a command structure uh, there's identification of targets for example the Marquis was uh, through certain contacts was in touch with England all the time primarily to Gaul's people uh, but they were given targets they were provided supplies and all this so they uh, are military in nature and the same thing applies during the Civil War these guerrilla groups even though they ran, ran independently quite often they were also uh, commissioned officers by the, uh, at least the ones I'm aware of, by the, uh, the the Confederate government, and occasionally they were given a mission that they had to complete. 
So even though they were just outlaws in one sense, they were also a function of the military and, and the command structure. And some of the rewards from their excursions were, were turned over to the Confederacy. And I think in the Maquis, you know, the redistribution of supplies that were stolen to other units was there. So the uh, guerrilla bands have to have a degree of security for their own protection, but they also have to have strings out. And apparently in a number of cases in the McKee, those strings out could be compromised. The guy's willing to, to save his life to give up the people that he knows either downstream or upstream from himself, or maybe even set them up. Uh, so the, the difference is one has that chain of command and that structure and that networking with other people that creates the risk where the security team if it's properly developed, has no risk at all. Or just about, I should say, risk at all. Okay, well, does a security team need to standardize their weapons? Because I remember uh, some, you know, survivalist group, retreat groups and militia units uh, occasionally uh, <laughs> uh, quibbling with each other about, you know, um, you know, 56 versus 7.62 uh, millimeter as far as their standard caliber or, or different things like that. So does a security team need to standardize their weapons? Probably not. One of the security team members had a, a pistol and I think all the time that we were formed, probably seven or eight months, never got the pistol out of the safe at his house. Um, only when you anticipate the need for the pistol, and that varies from person to person. George and Linda obviously were more than willing uh, uh, to, to, to carry out that role. But standardization, World War II, the, the government it provided tens of thousands of what was called a liberator. It was a little pistol that was sheet metal. To extract the cartridge, you had to take a wooden peg and push it out. And it came with, I don't know, uh, a handful of 45 bullets. The idea was quite simple. You take this, walk up to a German, shoot him in the head, grab his rifle and, and his ammo uh, pouches, and, and you're armed. Uh, do they need to be the same caliber? If you're going to be fighting a lot of combat, yes. But if you're a security team, you don't expect to get in a combat situation. So, no, I think that each person, in our case, had we had a variety of weapons between us. And... Uh, we never even thought of the need for standardization because we're not going into combat going to need, you know, 500 rounds of ammo. All right. Well, speaking about, uh, I guess, the organizational philosophy, I, I, for lack of a better term, about, uh, about this kind of thing, would it be accurate to say that a security team abides by the concept of leaderless resistance then? Uh, to some degree, uh, they abide by the concept of leaderless resistance. Now, uh, the the article on leaderless resistance, which should be getting posted in the uh, uh, chat right about now, the articles, uh, leaderless resistance is, is more of a military force, and so somewhere along the line it's got to extend its communication to involve other groups for larger missions or uh, uh, identification of, of certain targets where the security team is is generally, if they're going to do anything, it's going to be resupply themselves, food, uh, ammunition, uh, weapons, anything, transportation, gasoline, water, whatever they need. Uh, so their their purpose is a lot less in, in that respect. Now, later to this resistance, the concept, and when you go into combat, it's almost impossible, in, in fact, it's true in almost anything, if you've ever served on jury duty, the jury always picks its own foreman, or it's supposed to. Uh, and that person is picked because the other people judge this person thinks, and he, you know, he might give us a for whatever reason he's going to be the head of the group. Our security team had no such leadership. But if I'm going into combat as leaderless resistance is described by Lewis Beam. Uh, then there has to be a higher degree of coordination and organization to it. And so it's a misconception to say leaderless resistance is without a leader. It does not have an external leadership. It does not have the chain of command. It might have communication uh, for both acquisition of information and identification of targets. But 
generally somebody's got to look at uh, at the situation on the ground and say, okay, three of you over there because they've got some people out there and uh, one of you in charge. He's got to be the sergeant or however you want to look at it. Where the security team, if we ran into a situation, well, uh, you pick a lead. For example, on my coming back from Waco, George and Linda were the lead. Uh, on hiding Peter Chernoff, I was the lead. Uh, on getting rid of the, the fax machine, nobody was really the lead. Uh, George and Linda, or Linda requested it. I passed it on to one of the other members, and the job was done. Uh, so we would have somebody that was the lead in something, the one that got us into something, Thing, unless he passed it off, generally would be the lead. So we didn't really have a leader, uh, but in any situation, somebody uh, had a better overview of what was happening and would be the coordinator for the effort. But in again, back to leaders of this resistance, you've basically got a combat team. And, and so you will probably pick somebody pretty confident uh, because your life is going to be at risk in his hands and it's not the variety of situations security team runs into generally they're going to be combat type situations all right so let's get a little bit more deeper into how uh, a security team works then so I guess a good place to start would be how does a security team hold meetings well, we were concerned about security and you know bugging devices nowadays can be about the size of a fat thumbtack or a push pin uh, and they can have many hours of life and so it's easy to bug a table in a restaurant so quite simply my office was fairly central to everybody on the team so every Thursday uh, whatever time it was I don't recall what time we met now we would meet at my office and we'd pull out the phone book or somebody would suggest a restaurant and we'd go to that restaurant uh, so nobody knew where we were going until we decided to go and if my office was bugged, they might go, but as soon as the decision was made, we got in our respective cars and drove there. Now, when we got there, we chose a table that gave us the best observation of both front and back doors and kept a constant lookout. We observed the actions of people that came in. We never noticed anything askew, but uh, uh, we were very conscious of security and we didn't want to be bugged. We did talk about things that I will not talk about in public now, and, and uh, uh, well, I, I, I can generalize in them. We did talk about uh, some of the members looked at some of the uh, grocery warehouses in the Orlando area and, and how to best access them, where we could get close to them without being on their property, how we could get in, uh, grab food supplies and get back out, same thing with gun stores. There were a lot of things that individual members were doing and, and making notes of so that we had uh, the means to operate, but our meetings were held uh, without prior notice, and if we were concerned, we probably would not even have made the decision in the office for fear the office might be bugged. Uh, we'd probably go outside and play a radio and decide what restaurant to go to, but uh, we never got in that heightened level, but we did talk on occasion about a heightened level of determination of where a meeting was going to be, but a public place like a restaurant we felt was ideal for it, and well, it was good business for a lot of restaurants in town because I think we did use a couple of restaurants two or three times over the seven or eight month period. Uh, but generally, there was no pattern and nothing identifiable. So any any effort at bugging where we were meeting would be non-existent. Now our assembly area would have been out in the woods where it was impossible to bug us. They didn't know where it was. Um, so I mean, it's just is common sense to to do it so, somewhat along that line so that you uh, avoid being bugged because if somebody finds out the existence of the team, which I don't think anybody ever did, anybody that I ever knew never knew anything about this team, not even my son. He just thought George and Linda were helping me. So if, as long as you keep it a secret there's and have no name to it, when you have a name, the government can start looking, well, who are these Wolverines? Who are these Viper militia? Who are these? And they can go after it. And uh, if they don't know if it's existence, it's really hard to bug. They might be pursuing an individual there and, and try and use that. So there could be direction created by, uh, say, mine or George or Linda's activity that they wanted to, to bug. But the, the meetings were never held in the same place for all intents and purposes. And they were never held 
in a private home uh, or in, in my office. All right, so I think you were kind of alluding to this a little bit earlier, but I, I hope you can go into more uh, detail about this. How does a security team make decisions exactly? Well, I talked about it in terms of uh, who the, the uh, primary person was in any of these operations. Uh, as far as the other decisions that were made at the meetings about how we were going to stru structure ourselves, uh, what form of security we were going to provide, things like that, they were by consensus, but for the most part they tended to be unanimous. We talked as, as much as we had to with the pros and cons. And I don't think that we really ever, there was only one area that I can think of where there was a bit of controversy on dealing with a certain situation. And that had to do that if we created additional teams, I could create a team under me, but they would never know the existence of the other security team, the one that I was a member. They would think it was just me. Uh, However, if there was ever a call up and we went to the assembly area, then I would have these people tell them they would not know ahead of time like the rest of us did. Only I knew where the uh, 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 meetup area was, the, the assembly area. And when it was time to go there, if somebody, uh, they would be brought together and at that point, security lockdown, you might say. If somebody said, I got to call my wife and tell her, or uh, let me go to the restroom or anything and this is where the question came in it was finally resolved unanimously what do you do with that person you take your pistol and squeeze a bullet into his head because him wanting to go away from there might be a breach of security and one of the members said well that's not fair you're judge jury and executioner and I said look what's at risk or we all said well at least a few of them said well, look what's at risk with the whole team if we get an infiltrator in there, is it worse to get rid of one guy by mistake or risk the entire organization, the entire group? And he finally uh, relented and said, yeah, I see your point. I think uh, you're right. I'd do everything I could to avoid it, but I, I, I do see the necessity. If, if it seems that somebody wants to communicate, drops a piece of paper or anything, I guess the only choice we have is to get rid of them. But that was the only one that I can recall where there was even a question and that probably went on for uh, you know the whole lunch an hour hour and a half or something before we finally came to uh, complete consensus unanimous decision on on uh, how that would apply who is eligible to join a security team well uh, there's an article I wrote a while back that should be posted up there um, When you start a security team, you finish the security team. That's the only safe way. If you're looking at increasing your membership, you increase your risk. Ours just came together, you know, in a short period of time for a specific purpose. But it, it's people that you know and trust. Um, however, there are, there are things to look for. In fact. Um, I want to get a, a link posted here for something uh, that I've been working on. Uh, if somebody's been arrested and there was no disposition of their case or, you know, they, they were charged with possession of marijuana or child abuse or something like that, and then nothing ever happened, you don't want that person on your team. You don't know what's behind it. Um, There, if a guy's got a record, well, I had possession of marijuana many years ago, actually twice, once in Florida and once in, in Pennsylvania back in the 60s. Um, you, you have to look closely. You, you, you cannot afford to allow anybody in that team that you have any doubts about at all. And once the team is formed, it's locked down. Like I said, I could have, or any one of the other members could have created a sub-team that had no knowledge of the, the primary team, uh, so the any expansion would be without the knowledge of the original concept. You just don't bring people in after the fact. Now, there might be circumstances that, you know, say a design of a security team other than ours 
did want to bring in new members. Now, there's a link there for application for participation. It's something that I worked up at the request of some people a while back. What do we do if we do want to bring somebody in the group? Um, this would apply to militia. Not to committees of safety, but perhaps committees of safety. Subcommittees where things were being discussed that you don't want let out, but the committee of safety has to be open to anybody that's an American. Just, uh, you, there are certain restrictions that we implemented in Florida and South Bend, Indiana, and as far as who could join the committee of safety, but it's generally open. But if you have a militia or a subcommittee or some kind of organization where you want to bring other people in, uh, that application talks about uh, a good approach to evaluating people that are coming in. Uh, if I made a sub team and I, somebody wanted to come in that I didn't know, uh, then I would probably have applied something uh, the same to even the ones I knew, that everybody would be brought in that way. But I don't think I'd be inclined for that. I think if I made a team, it would be relatively small and people that I knew already. But you have to be very careful. Everybody wants numbers. We've got a militia and we're 300 strong. Well, who are those 300 people? I don't know. What do they look like? Well, that guy's picture on Facebook, he looks younger than he sounds, but I've never met him. Oh, well, shit. That's good security. Yeah. Um, look at these uh, police officers who play like little girls or little boys to try and type people on set. Uh, set. Anybody who relies on the internet for any communication to provide any form of security is, pardon my expression, an idiot. Uh, you have to, what that application recommends is first you have a meeting with them and don't even discuss the subject. If you're uh, going to invite them into a militia, you go meet them for a beer or a cup of coffee, depending on your moral convictions, I guess. But uh, you sit down and talk with them about what sports do you like, you know, what are your hobbies? Uh, you don't even talk about the militia. You just get an idea of what he's like. And the beer, or the, uh, especially the coffee, to some degree, loosens people up. You get racked, relax, have a, a casual conversation that has nothing to do with the organization. Now, everybody, that, some of the people that have looked at this have said, well, that's not fair. You're asking all kinds of personal information from me. Well, if I want my electric turned on, I've got to have submitted all my personal information to a greater degree to somebody prior to that. I have to have a bank account. They've got my social security number. Uh, they've got my mother's maiden name. They got all kinds of stuff. If I want a job, I got to talk about uh, criminal record, previous employment, and all that. And so this application, the so with the exception of the social security number, which we don't ask for, is asking to get an idea of the background now. You might have the background, and it might or might not be true. In fact, I was talking to somebody today, and it was a rather interesting conversation, because he was talking about the background of one of the officers in their group. And, uh, oh, well, this guy's background is phenomenal. What about his DD-214? Oh, he says that's a secret. Wait a minute. No, they're not. You can't get VA benefits without a 214. Now, I know some people who are in special services, and their DD-214 shows their, their duration of their service, the highest rank, uh, MOS, things like that, but it does not mention some of the other things they did. They're, not, they're classified, and they don't go on the 214, but if the guy was in military service, he's got a 214 unless he was in the Navy and perhaps the Marines because they use a different form. But everybody, when they gets out, when they separate from service, gets some paperwork. And I think I got eight eight carbon copies when I got out of the service. I needed for VA. I needed for this. I needed for that. Anytime I had to prove I had service. Uh, so, if a guy claims military service, he better have a two fourteen, or he's a lot, probably a long time son of a bitch. So. Uh, Okay, to, to follow up on that, though, should a security team actively recruit members then? Well, not a security team, no, but, uh, I mean, we're talking about this. If, you're, if, if you structure, if you decide in your security team you want to recruit people, which I think is foolish, then, then follow these procedures. If somebody has all these jobs, call, just, uh, um, somebody's applied to employment with us, and I want to talk to you about his... Uh, work practices at your business. Uh, his name's Joe Smith, and he worked from you from then to then. Well, that guy never worked here. No, he, we don't have any record of him. You know, 
you track these things down, a few phone calls could save the security of your, your organization. And I would never recommend that a security team recruit except on a different tier, as I've mentioned. And I would, they, they would never recruit uh, without having a good understanding this, uh, of, uh, of the nature of the people. I've known them for a long time without regard to the Patriot community. But you could use this application to do that, but the application is worthless unless you follow up on the information in the application. You know, I think there's more snipers, military snipers on the internet than the Army's ever had. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, well, how should, okay, well, Gary, how should a security team securely communicate then? Well, uh, we had talked about different methods, but uh, we never went beyond the meetings. Um, now, Sleepy, you and I have talked about this, and, and a lot of people use the Internet now, and we're working on great distances. The problem is we really don't know who's on the other end. I don't know what you look like, Sleepy. I see different... Every time you change your picture, you're somebody else. Uh, <laughs> well, during my... Well, back during the days when I have my own YouTube channel, I... Uh, I, I did make it an effort to give as a, a variety of theatrical appearances, yes. <laughs> but uh, internet communication, if you did have to do it and had already assured that the person that you're working with is secure, uh, PGP, which you've written about on your blog, is good. However, uh, Zimmerman was charged with criminal activity back in the 90s or late 80s, somewhere back when uh, PGP 3 or 4, somewhere in that era. Uh, and, and then the charges were dropped against him. They never took him to court and they never went to prison. To my knowledge, never paid any fines even. Uh, so he might well have given the government a back door to all the subsequent PGPs. Now, if you encrypt something off the computer, now when I say off the computer, it doesn't have to be off. You could do it in a, a word processor, or you could might write a little routine. But the thing is, that's very secretive. Uh, you don't let that out. But if you encrypted something and it came out garbage, and then you encrypted the garbage in PGP and and sent it, and the government intercepted it. And remember, an email. If I send somebody an email, and don't trust Hushmail any more than anything else, or this burn note or things like that. Um, if somebody intercepts your email, you will never know it. And if PGP has given the back door, if they intercept your email, they'll decrypt it using the back door. Trouble is, when they're done decrypting it, because it's already been encrypted before you PGP encrypted it, what they get is garbage. So they might think that you changed the logarithm or something in it. They don't know where the garbage is going. So double encryption, one off computer and one on computer, is probably the most secure way. This didn't, we were back in the fax days then, but uh, in there's the old concept of using a mask in a written document, so you can fax, fax and have a mask, but in the internet, uh, double encryption would be the only way to do it. Uh, phone communication, what we did uh, uh, quite simply out of Waco is, I went down to pay phone one day and I called uh, a number uh, that was one of the team members, that not one that I'd been talking to while I was in Waco, and I gave him it was something like A, and then an area uh, phone number, B, a phone number, C, a phone number, D, a phone number. And these were four pay phones that I had access to. And this is when you could receive calls on pay phones. Uh, a lot of pay phones you can't receive calls on now. And then uh, he called me back later with pay phones in the Orlando area. And so if I called, say, George and said, uh, uh, B at about 4 o'clock this afternoon, 6 o'clock your time, uh, then George would be at that pay phone B, and I would call him on his B phone number at that time. Uh, the likelihood of it being tapped in is, is almost non-existent, but technology's changed too, and if understanding by some people is correct, and it might be that all phone calls are stored in a complex in Salt Lake City, Utah, I think it is, but it, uh, there was an article about it back in the 90s that uh, virtually all phone calls in, uh, on hardwire in this country today go through a switching station in Salt Lake City. That means they can strip off the conversation and store it for years. There have been subsequent articles of, uh, about that. 
Now, using code words and things like that can uh, give you, provide you a little uh, protection. Staying away from keywords can provide a little protection. Um, handwritten uh, cryptic notes can be used. Uh, but verbal communication is susceptible too because they have these parabolic antennas and they can listen to a whispered conversation a couple hundred yards away unless the wind's blowing the wrong way for them. So was, the only thing that's safe is getting away from people like out in the swamp where our assembly area was or having a radio going louder than your conversation so that a parabolic antenna would not pick up your conversation uh, and doing it out in the open um, but communication is something that in each case you have to what do you have to communicate that you should have something in advance uh, that you can utilize to uh, do your best now if they're saving all these phone calls that means somebody's got to listen to them so they're going to keyword them or identify them by phone numbers uh, and so if I'm going payphone to payphone they have no fun phone number to identify me with uh, you just have to think and, and think how can we communicate without obviously the best security in the world is a courier now it didn't work very well for John Andre uh, got him hung but uh, a written note or a, a verbal or an oral message to a courier uh, he carries it to the, to the other person and delivers it directly and only to that uh, the recipient is about the only safe communication and that's assuming your cur courier hasn't been compromised so communication is a serious problem face-to-face -face is the best but even then you have to use security uh, direct uh, physical communication via courier whether it be oral or, or written uh, is probably second best uh, anything beyond that is iffy at best, but if you think of how the government works, you can probably bypass things by avoiding keywords, and it does, it makes a lot of sense. But one of the encryptions in, in the Revolutionary War just had keywords that a uh, tree would mean battle. Uh, you know, you just take some words, and the you, you both have the key code. A tree means battle. Uh, uh, water means army, and so you can write something about the tree is growing nicely uh, uh, the battle is is going on uh, well you, I guess you could think you know, they could be more applicable but you can write a message that sounds like a social conversation and convey a lot of information wow that's that's quite fantastic and uh, you know perhaps maybe in the future we should do an episode on uh, on privacy and uh, infosec or information security and, and things like that because the, I I, especially that suggestion you mentioned earlier about, uh, about both having an online and an offline way of encrypting uh, and decrypting messages is quite fantastic. Although kind of kind of going along that uh, line of thought, how does a security team weed out undercover operatives, agent provocateurs, and the assorted informants? Well, if your security team is set up like ours, you wouldn't have to because you would have nobody after the initial meeting, and if you if you were compromised, you're probably all out of the game from that point on. So, uh, but uh, looking in a more general sense, if you had a different form of security team, if you had a if you had a uh, committee of safety or something like that, uh, how do you weed out people? Uh, I think one good way is quite physical, but you get the game cam. Uh, actually, you don't even need a game cam. You just go out in the woods somewhere, and you dig a hole, uh, say two foot by two foot, and then you fill it back in, and you place a rock on top of it, and place a, a leaf under the rock. just a small leaf under the rock. And then you have a new guy come in, and you've checked him out, and you feel comfortable with him. You want to give him a final check. You say, look, we each person is uh, each um, cache has got three people assigned to it, and we only have two on this cache, so I'm going to take you out there, and you're going to be the third member to know this cache. And he's going to say, well, what's in it? Um, it's there if you ever need it. If, if things happen, the cache needs to be exposed. And you just don't answer the question, and don't say you can't answer it. Just say it's there if you need it. So he's going to be curious as to what it is, and you take him out and show him where the boulder is, you know, where to park, where to walk, and here's here's the boulder. This is the cache. 
and then uh, you take him back and say the need ever arises somebody says I need cash 13 you take take them there you know if, uh, or, or you go out there and secure the cash uh, equipment and bring it back then you wait a few days and then you go back out there and see if the leaf's still in place it's kind of a simple one now if you had a game can a motion sensing game can you could even set that up but the idea is to test the guy when he's got the opportunity and him not knowing what's in the cache or if you want to make it real interesting you could probably say well there's some hand grenades in there but don't tell anybody but you want to make him curious enough to see what really is in there that's one way to test um, what I said before about records if they don't have a 214 and they've got military service they're lying to somebody themselves or to you more than likely you than them uh, maybe to themselves too maybe it's pathological in fact I think you're aware of an instance that uh, it seems that there was a pathological aspect to military service recently um, yeah the interesting thing about agent provocateurs I've been accused of being one for for many years but an agent provocateur to be effective has to first provoke you and this happened with the viper militia hootering militia and everything else he has to provoke you and then he has to be there to testify since I don't join anything anymore I can't be there to testify I'm not party to any planning I'm just an advocate of some pretty aggressive approaches to dealing with government but that uh, makes me an agent provocateur in the eyes of some people um, but an agent provocateur is the one that starts suggesting things that go beyond the consensus of the group. Uh, it applies, in, in the case of Joe Sims, it applies to somebody who says, I can find somebody that can supply you the rice and gas. Uh, if a guy should not have access to rice and gas, and he says he has access to rice and gas, you have a serious question about him. All you got to do is be att uh, pay attention and not be too greedy. I want dynamite. This guy says he can get dynamite. You got to think, should he have access to dynamite? If he wouldn't normally have access to dynamite, you better find out a lot about him before you let him supply you the dynamite because once that dynamite is in your hands, you're the guilty party. Uh, informants in a group is, is really hard to expose. Uh, there, we posted an article a little while, a link a little while ago. Let's post it again. Informants amongst us. It talks about some aspects of that. There's another one called Vortex that is uh, is worth consideration. Uh, number six. Um, Vortex talks about types of informants and infiltration uh, that occurs. These are the people that the Vortex is the people that are the interface. Uh, that's known by both sides and the only one that's known by both sides sees where everything swirls around comes back out the other side um, If there's ever any suspicion let's go back to what happens when the team was going to assemble under an emergency situation if there's ever any doubt Don't take the risk take the solution now, if it's a critical thing, now I got accused of being a bad guy once because somebody said I said kill a patriot because I said if they couldn't have stopped the guys that were going to dump the rice and gas and the uh, fruits in Atlanta any other way, then they should take him out in the woods and take care of him. And they said I suggested killing a patriot. Well, if the guy wants to run, dump, dump rice and gas in the freeways in Atlanta, he's not a patriot, number one, so I'm not killing a patriot by a long shot. But uh, if you're not sure and you've got, you know, five, three, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, fifty people who are at risk because of uh, the possibility that one man's bad, if you can't isolate him and re remove him from the equation, you may have to remove him completely. And that's the reality of survival. Uh, I know it's rather harsh, but you think the Maquis in, in France, and, and one book I read years ago about that, they, uh, the Germans a lot of times who could not get somebody to talk would try and get the Marquis to think that they had turned informant and then the Marquis would kill that person uh, there was an incident on the uh, uh, Sioux reservation back in the I think it was in the 80's uh, Anna May Aquash who was out of Canada uh, the BLM Indians the, the traditional Indians the BLM was working with the FBI this is where Leonard uh, 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 Peltier uh, was charged with killing FBI agents. Uh, but Anna Mae Aquash, 
uh, would not, as near as I can tell from what I've read about the people who have investigated the story, she would not. The, because she was a Canadian, the government tried to intimidate her into turning against the traditionals. She would not turn against the traditionals, and the FBI didn't like what she was doing, so either the FBI or the BLM Indians kind of leaked word that she was an informant to the FBI. Now, nobody's sure who killed her, but her hand, the FBI cut her hands off and sent them to Washington for fingerprinting. Nice way to fingerprint people. But she was found dead in the snow. Um, she was probably a good guy on the traditional side, and the other side didn't like her, whether it was BLM or FBI. But anyway, she ended up dead. Uh, so some people can be set up to be in that at-risk position of appearing to be an informant. But are you better off? You know, it's a hard call. But when, when there's a lot at risk, you have to be extremely careful of what uh, you allow to happen within your organization. Now, earlier you were mentioning about uh, you know, veterans producing their DD-214s when they're asked, when they're joining an organization, security team, or what have you. So, um, how do you perform background checks on prospective members of the team? Well, I'm not sure. I think that uh, if you go to the U.S. Army page, for example, you can verify a, a 214. You'd have to give the name and service number. Uh, I don't know what information you have to get, and they'll verify that there what is a 214, whether the 214 is public or not, I don't know. Uh, on employment, call the previous employer. Say, I, this guy's applied for a job with me. I want to find out what his background is. Talk to him. Make sure he worked there. Find out. You're, you're a potential employer. Was he at work every day on time? Did, did you have any problems with him? Now, most employers are reluctant to say bad things because they might get sued nowadays. But in talking with the previous employers that he's put on the application, You'll get a picture of what this guy's like. He's very boisterous. He didn't get along with other people. I don't want him in my group. Uh, criminal record. Uh, every case, every charge brought against somebody has a final disposition. Um, there was a guy named Charles Dyer. He was charged with having a uh, grenade launcher. And uh, I told the people that were supporters of Charles Dyer that I would not even get involved in the story until I see the disposition on the... Uh, uh, the grenade launcher charge when he was charged with uh, 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 child abuse later. Um, finally, I got two copies. One was signed by the jury foreman and the other one was signed by the court confirming the verdict of acquittal on the grenade launcher charges. Uh, if somebody's charged with possession of marijuana, uh, he's going to get an acquittal, he's going to get a, uh, a sentence, or he's going to get a, an adjudication withheld or something. If it's adjudication withheld, that is the typical on a plea agreement. As long as you perform on the plea agreement, we will not bring the charges against you, and after a certain time you meet the certain hoops, uh, you'll, you'll be okay. Now, Informus Against Us has quotes out of a plea agreement that was offered to a friend of mine in Florida back in the 90s, and you'll see that they've got you by the... Uh, uh, proverbials uh, when you sign a plea agreement. So if somebody has an adjudication withheld on a criminal charge that he admits to, now it's easy to do back criminal checks on people nowadays on the internet too. It's available. Uh, I know some organizations actually have set up accounts and you pay a dollar or something. It's a nominal charge to run criminal background checks on people. It might not give you all the information, but if there's a charge that he did not put on the list, you've got to find out why he didn't put it on the list, and then you've got to track it down and see what the final disposition was. If he doesn't have a copy of the disposition of acquittal, then you've got to find out if it was uh, uh, that he was sentenced, given probation, his probation's up. If he's still on probation, he still belongs to the government. You don't want somebody that's on probation or on parole in your organization because he still belongs to the government. Uh, but if he served his time, and uh, then you're safe. But if it's uh, uh, adjudication withheld, that's the worst one. That, that, that means that they're holding this hammer over his head. And if he doesn't comply with them, even to the point of lying to get to bust you, um, he goes to prison. And once he's compromised himself by signing the plea agreement, it's just a small step, not a big step, to turn and lie about somebody that he's working 
So uh, the, the bottom line is you follow through. When If you're doing a background check on somebody, don't just ask him. Don't just believe him. Check things out. Make the phone calls. It doesn't hurt. People answer questions. Previous employers never have a problem answering uh, questions about their uh, you know, uh, past employee. Um, criminal records checks available on the internet, but you can ask him what was the disposition of each of the cases he listed. Well, if they're traffic, it doesn't mean anything, but if they're serious charges, uh, find out what the disposition was. Go to the court. Don't take his word for it. If they said he was, he was found not guilty or acquitted, uh, you can contact that court with the case number and they can tell you what the final disposition was, probably give, provide you a copy of it. You might have to go down and get it. It might be available online. It might be free. It might be for charge. But you can bet. All you have to do is take the information you've got and investigate it. Make sure that you do because think of what's at risk if you don't be extremely careful on who you're going to put your faith in. Yes, uh, a lesson that uh, some of us have had to learn the hard way, obviously. So, kind of on a related note to that, why is it important for team members to keep their own counsel and not just blab to strangers or people who don't have a need to know about the uh, uh, about their operation? Well, uh, there was an extremely quiet. A uh, secret group created fairly recently, and uh, they changed their name somewhere along the line. Now I know about them. Now I didn't tell anybody about them, and I still won't say what the group was or anything. But <laughs> it was a secret group, and everybody. I, 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 I'm assuming everybody knew about it. I knew about it. Now, the funny thing about a secret, um, Sleepy, if I tell you, can you keep a secret? I like to think I can. I can, too. That's the answer. If I tell you the secret, can I expect you to be any more secretive about it than I was? Absolutely not. So, if you ask me, uh, you know, I won't tell anybody... Uh, but tell me about this organization, and then I turn around and say, Sleepy, can you say keep a secret? And you say, yes, I can. And I say, I can too. That closes the door, for it, doesn't it? Yeah, Secrets it have to be. Once you give it out, one person gives it out, there's no telling where it may go. Uh, people talk about OPSEC. This is operational security. Integrity says if you have a secret, keep it. Keep it as well as you expect the person that you don't tell to keep it. However you want to look at it, don't say anything. Uh, okay. Well, how, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. What does a security team do, if anything at all, when one of their members gets arrested? Well, I think it depends on why he got arrested. He was drunk and disorderly and picked up one on the street. <laughs> you wait until he gets out, and then you be very concerned about what the consequences, find out what the final dis disposition was. Um, if he gets arrested, uh, as we anticipated might happen to George or Linda or myself, um, that's a tough call. The team has to decide, can we get him? Uh, you know, if you watch, uh, well, last time I was arrested, Florida, I got picked up in Orange County for a charge in Seminole County, so it was an Orange County jail for, oh, about 16 hours, and then they transported me to Seminole, and go, obviously going to Seminole would be the ideal time to get out, uh, which means if you knew there was going to be a transfer, you just take the place out and, and, and deal with uh, the escape then, and that comes within the terms of self-defense, because if you reach the court cases that I have, uh, or the Constitution, for that matter. No person shall be held to answer. That means arrested and held for trial. And even if you're on bail, you're arrested because if you don't show up for trial, you you, uh, you give up your bail. So any, no person held to answer for any criminal, no person may be held to answer for any criminal, uh, let's see, capital or infamous crime. Infamous crime is a, a uh, 
but back then would, would be what we call a felony today. Back then it was described as a year and a day in prison, except under presentment or indictment by a grand jury. That's federal. That's in the Constitution, Fourth Amendment. Um, no person can be held to answer without an indictment of a grand jury. If there's no indictment of a grand jury, how can the federal government arrest me? Now you have to look at your state constitution to see what provision is there. Do they have a lawful right? There's a, a Supreme Court decision uh, from 1900 that I've written about extensively. Uh, if a law enforcement officer comes to arrest you without a lawful warrant, do you have the right to kill him? Well, the Supreme Court said it may be a misdemeanor, it may be no crime at all if you do, if he does not have a lawful warrant. Now what's a lawful warrant? That requires a grand jury indictment. And absent a grand jury indictment, so if, if somebody comes to arrest me, where's grand jury indictment? You don't have one. Then I would like to get out to my security team. They don't have grand jury indictment. That would make any act they took to recover me and, and restore my liberty, according to John uh, Badout versus United States, completely legal. Now, everybody talks about giving up their rights. I've not given up any rights. I do question, uh, you know, what are the consequences if I try, try and defend these rights right now? Uh, I've got to make a decision, sometimes in a split second. For example, one time when I was arrested in Florida, I had a 9mm 380 laying about 6 inches from my hand, an AK-47 round in the chamber, safety was on, but uh, uh, 30 rounds in the, in the uh, magazine, about a foot and a half from my left. Okay, well... 9mm pistols in... You know, am I going to pick up a gun and shoot back? No. You started to interrupt me. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. I guess the audio cut out of my end. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so you decide what it's worth doing. Uh, but if you don't defend those rights, you have relinquished them. You have given them up. The government hasn't taken away. You've acquiesced to their removal. And that's the uh, that's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, if you're willing to defend your rights, you haven't lost them. You may end up losing your life as a consequence, but you have not lost your rights. And that's, unfortunately, the, the difference between 1900 John Bad Elk and today, where <laughs> a lot of people have lost their lives, including George and Linda, because George and Linda were defending their liberty when they shot the cop. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. So, I, I guess kind of segueing into George and Linda then, what does a security team do when one of their members gets killed? Well, uh, again, weigh the consequences. George and Linda were in Alabama. The security team, except myself, were in Florida, Orlando area, and I was in Connecticut. Uh, there was no possibility of immediate response. Now, understand that they shot a cop. What's the most severe kind of crime in this country? If you shot the president, you'd probably be better off than if you shot a cop. At least in the eyes of the cops, right? So there was virtually no chance of um, creating an escape situation for George and Linda. Now, I went down to Opelika uh, after I left the Golden Hill Pekisic Reservation and uh, talked to Linda's attorney, not George's, and uh, he arranged for me to spend some time with Linda alone. He and I went down, he told the, 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 the uh, sheriff or the jailer that I was his assistant and we went in and talked to Linda. He left and I was there another half an hour or 45 minutes with Linda talking about things. But that's the best I could do and I talked with her about it and she realized there's nothing we could do at that point. If you could catch them in transport, perhaps you can. If they're in a small jail, perhaps you can. Personally, nothing that we could do unless we had an armed force of a couple hundred people surround that building and threaten them with demolition if, if they didn't acquiesce and let out the prisoners that we wanted. So, you know, the, the days of the old wooden jail with metal bars on them, uh, you know, five, five metal bars are gone, the, you know, when the horse pulls the, the bars out of the window. Those, those don't exist anymore. So, 
you do what you can. Now, I tried to help from the outside. I suggested that they use John Bad Elk for defense, but they opted for the missing 13th Amendment. And uh, it didn't work. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of information on my page about George and Linda, but, you know, it's a, it basically a done deal. The government wanted to kill these people, so they murdered them by uh, under the guise of, of uh, capital punishment. That they were wonderful people, and they were good people to have on your side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Since we're starting to, to uh, wind down a little bit for this particular episode, how can someone start their own security team? You know, I was probably the fourth member of the team. I don't recall. I think I know who it was that that came up with the idea, uh, and I think I knew at the time, but I don't recall now. But. If you've got some people you trust, you just start talking to them about it and create the security team. I can't give you a form. You have to know if you trust the people and how well you trust them, and you know, you've got to put all the pieces together. Okay. Wow. 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 I'm I'm absolutely blown away by uh, by uh, by what you've been detailing to us tonight about how a security team actually works, and I can't thank you enough. Uh, for coming on and really describing uh, what it is, because I have never heard about security teams uh, before I ever got in contact with you. Because I, because you know, the only options that were presented to me and a lot of other people were, you know, you either got to be in a militia unit, or you have to be in a survivalist retreat group, or maybe even a guerrilla band, or you're out on your own ass just by yourself. So you're you're very um, your presentation of what a security team is, is a, is a refreshing, uh, option. You broke up there. You did mention one other, what if a security member team gets killed, say, by the government? And this is something, when I got back to Florida, I talked about a couple of the other members, and we contemplated retaliation. But um, the risk was too great to retaliate. I just wanted to get that in. And you have to consider how great is the risk. Um, the cop that they got in the confrontation with was Motley. He died. Uh, it is possible had we identified the cop that arrested them, but hey, they were surrounded. You know, they, they went down a road and I guess it was a dead end and they were surrounded by cops, so there's no individual cop that got them, but the possibility of retaliating against a cop that had arrested them, had he been identifiable, was one thing that uh, we did consider at the time. I just wanted to get that in. And again, I, in defense of their lives, the government can kill you for killing a cop and you can kill a cop for killing your friends. I think that's fair. I don't think the government is senior to us by a long shot. I think we're senior to the government. And I, I think I think a lot of people would think that's that's fair, even though that may not be a very popular thought. But uh, I was merely just saying that I think it's uh, wonderful how your description of what a security team is presents another option uh, to those of us, uh, because the options that are presented us through the years to me and as well as to other people is that you either have to be in a militia unit or a survivalist retreat group or maybe even a guerrilla band, but you, or you're just out on your own lonesome. But the, uh, the notion of a security team uh, is very unique and I think can really help people, especially when there's not a lot of infrastructure to help them uh, use any of those other options. So I thank you very much for coming on tonight and telling us what exactly uh, security, security teams are. Well, I, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I hope that uh, at least some of the people out there can uh, learn a little and perhaps, uh, you know, what we did is it was spontaneous. We created what we felt suited us. Uh, it gives you a general idea. You don't have to be as as harsh as we were. You don't have to be. Uh, you could be harsher than we were as far as what your intentions are and what your purpose is. But as far as a, a group of people working together in this country today, 
I don't think that anything can provide the internal security that a security uh, team concept provides. The militia does not at all. Every militia that's been busted has had the informant in the group. The Viper militia and back in the 90s, and the West Virginia militia to the Hooterim militia, that they always had the uh, Republic of Texas, Richard McLaren. They've always had their informant in place. And, and I'm going to guess that 10 to 60 percent of the patriots are in, uh, informants or have the government's best interest at heart. And I'm going to guess also that any militia composed of more than five people probably has a, 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 an informant in it. Um, I don't believe that our security team was ever compromised. Wow. Okay. Well, again, I'd like to thank you again so much for coming on and describing how this uh, how a security team works. Because again, I have never heard about security teams from anywhere else in the alternative media. So this is a very unique, and I really thought this was quite a fascinating and very valuably unique topic. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And thanks for inviting. All right. Thank you, Gary. Well, folks, if you found tonight's episode or any of our other broadcasts valuable to you, please consider donating to Acerado PF Radio. Uh, you can look for the PayPal button on the right-hand side, which is located at www.outpost-of-freedom.com slash radio, and uh, clicking the PayPal donate button. And one more time, that is outpost-of-freedom.com slash radio. We are listener supported. Uh, we don't uh, we don't work for the government or the corporate uh, media. So please help us stay independent as much as possible by donating to us today. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, catch us uh, about two weeks from now. I think we're going to have a. I believe our next episode is going to be about martial law. See you then. Bye bye. I had a dream the other night that. Stand. A figure walked in through the mist with a flintlock in his hand. His clothes were torn and dirty as he stood there by my bed. He took off his three-cornered hat and speaking low to me, he said, We fought a revolution to secure our liberty. We wrote the Constitution as a shield from tyranny. For future generations, this legacy we gave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. The freedoms we secured for you, we hoped you'd always keep. But tyrants labored endlessly while your parents were asleep. Your freedom's gone, your courage lost, you're no more than a slave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. You buy permits to travel and permits to own a gun. Permits to start a business or to build a place for one. On land that you believe you own, you pay a yearly rent. Although you have no voice in saying how the money's spent. Your children must attend a school that doesn't educate. And your Christian values can't be taught according to the state. You read about the current news in a regulated press. And you pay a tax you do not owe to please the IRS. Your money is no longer made of silver nor of gold. You trade your wealth for paper so your life can be controlled. You pay for crimes that make our nation turn from God and shame. You've taken Satan's number. You've traded in your name. You've given government control to those who do you harm so they could burn down churches and seize the family farm and keep our country deep in debt. Put men of God in jail. Harass your fellow countrymen while corrupted courts prevail. Your public servants don't uphold the solemn oaths they've sworn. And your daughters visit doctors so their children won't be born. Your leaders send artillery and guns to foreign shores and send your sons to slaughter fighting other people's wars. Can you regain the freedoms for which we fought and died? Or don't you have the courage or the faith to stand with pride? And are there no more values for which you'll fight to save? Or do you wish your children to live in fear and be a slave? O oh, sons of the Republic, arise, take a stand, defend the Constitution, the supreme law of the land, preserve our great Republic and each God-given right, and pray to God.
keep the torch of freedom burning bright. As I awoke, he'd vanished in the mist from whence he came. His words were true. We are not free, but we have ourselves to blame. For even now as tyrants trample each God-given right, we only watch and tremble, too afraid to stand and fight. If he stood by your bedside in a dream while you were asleep and wondered what remains of the freedoms he'd fought to keep, what would be your answer if he called out from the grave? Is this still the land of the free and home of the brave? God bless you and God bless this room.